Good evening, and welcome to the webinar, and greetings from Fenton, Michigan, USA. Tonight we are extremely fortunate to be joined by a world-leading clinician, Dr. Diego Velasquez, and he will be providing what I'm sure will be an extremely entertaining presentation on the topic of treatment of single-tooth extraction sockets. I'd like to start by telling you a little bit more about our speaker this evening. Dr. Diego Velasquez is a graduate of the Pontifica Universidad Javeriana School of Dentistry in Colombia, and he completed his postdoctoral training in prosthodontics and dental materials, and has a master's degree in the science of dentistry at Indiana University School of Dentistry. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Periodontology and a member of the peer review panel of the Journal of Periodontology. He is part of the expert council of the Osteology Foundation, and he has published a number of articles on prosthodontics, periodontics, and dental implant related topics, and has also lectured nationally and internationally. He is past president of the Midwest Society of Periodontology, and is the recipient of the prestigious Dr. and Mrs. Gerald Kramer Scholarship for Excellence Award. Dr. Velasquez works in private practice in Fenton, Michigan and is an adjunct clinical assistant professor at the School of Dentistry at the University of Michigan. Before handing over to Dr. Velasquez, I would just like to give you a little background about today's webinar, which is actually the last in a series of six webinars entitled The Geischlich World Webinar Tour 2017, and which is actually part of the Geischlich Key to Success. What is the Geischlich Key to Success? Well, your trust made us the worldwide number one reference. With more than 10 million patients treated with Geischlich BIOS, Geischlich BioGuide and Geischlich Mucograft and collaborations with more than 100 universities worldwide, we would like to share the knowledge and the treatment concept about our products that will lead to success. And the idea of sharing knowledge is at the heart of these webinars. The webinar is of course interactive and we will encourage you all to ask questions throughout the presentation. We will collate all the questions and have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. I'd like to draw your attention to the dialogue box at the top of the screen, which is where you're able to submit your question during the presentation. After the webinar, you will find the recording on our homepage. And I would just like to make one more point and making, mention the upcoming webinars in 2018 when we will broadcast a new series of six educational webinars, and I hope you will join us again next year. So once again, thank you for joining us for the webinar this evening. I will now hand over to our speaker, Dr. Diego Velasquez. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I wanted to express my gratitude to Geislich for allowing me to share this material this evening with uh, the audience. Uh, the title of this presentation is Treatment of Single Tooth Extraction Sockets. We are broadcasting from Fenton, Michigan, USA. Happy to be here. I'm going to be focusing the attention of this presentation to socket preservation, what we have come to coin as a term assisted healing. And uh, this is the outline of this evening's presentation. We're going to be covering the background. What is it that we are doing currently with alveolar reconstruction? We're going to be talking about trends and uh, we'll have some conclusion uh, remarks at the end before the question and answer session starts. So what is it that we know about this topic? Looking at the background, I would like to mention George Santiana who has reminded us that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, as he quoted back in 1905. It is important for us to know that we have had different individuals that have contributed to bring us up to speed and uh, make our experiences much richer based on their research, based on their clinical experience, and one of them that has to be quoted and has to be given credit is uh, Dr. Claflin. Back in 1936, he showed us how healing occurs when it is undisturbed in extraction wounds, a very nice sequence of events, a nice description of these events. 
Interestingly, back in 1956, efforts started by clinicians trying to maintain dimensional stability of extraction sockets, where Haug and Sander were working with acrylic roots, placing acrylic, sterilized acrylic in tooth sockets to maintain that dimensional stability. Different authors like Atwood and later on Johnson and uh, Jaime Petrokovsky later in 1967 performed some research looking at cephalograms and also utilizing models that were late, later poured in order to be able to, in a tangible fashion, see the uh, changes that had occurred after teeth had been removed. Credit also has to be given to Urist, who in 1971 was sharing with the world a recipe for BMPs that have become so uh, useful when it comes to regeneration of materials, regeneration of tissue, both hard and soft tissue. Then we have Lamb from Singapore, 1972, gave us the idea of maintaining roots as a way to preserve dimensional stability was controversial at that time, but uh, then was widely adopted, especially for partially and completely dentulous patients to preserve the ridges and the anatomy. I was finishing kindergarten myself in 1976 when my mentor, Jim Melonig, shared with us what allografts could do and how we could utilize them, of course, starting with regeneration around teeth and then applications have followed on alveolar sockets. A very clever, Introduction as well of hydroxylapatite by Denison and Groot in 1979 gave us an idea of what we could do with these type of materials when it came down to the preservation of these sides. Huge credit has to be given to Richard Lazara, periodontist colleague of ours, 1989. He showed us that implants could be placed immediately after a tooth had been removed and these implants were going to allow us to expedite treatment not only were we placing biological materials, biomaterials in these areas, but we started loading these sites with titanium after a tooth was removed. Tony Sklar allowed us to see also the possibilities of preserving these sites, utilizing a xenograft also protected with a collagen membrane. And it is something that came up in the late 90s and it is widely used nowadays as well. And I would like to close this historical review with the brilliant work that has been carried down in San Antonio, Texas by Brian Milley and his students, his residents. They have put together a plethora of efforts looking at different combinations of bone, whether it is allografts, xenografts, cancellous bone, cortical bone, all the combinations you can think of. And uh, they have come up with a series of randomized controlled trials, clinical trials, looking at histology, looking at combi, CT scans, allowing us to understand this topic beautifully. Credit has to be given to them. When we take a look at this big picture, we look at the different uh, pieces of this puzzle and we have to give credit to different authors, co-workers and colleagues that have allowed us to understand what we are doing nowadays in our clinic. There are a couple of terms that I would like to describe and define. One of them is the terminology or the term graft. Graft as a noun, alludes to any allograft, an alloprast, autograft, or a xenograft material that when it is placed with the intention of repairing, augmenting, or regenerating a defect or a deficiency. We are very familiar with graft and grafting procedures. It comes from centuries looking at botanical sciences that have allowed us to understand how grafts work and all this information has been extrapolated to medical applications where we're doing incredible things like saving limbs after accidents as depicted on this image. When we take a look at another term that is equally important, preservation, the preservation is the act of keeping something as it is, especially in order to prevent it from decaying or to protect it from being damaged or destroyed according to the Cambridge English Dictionary. And it is that combination of preservation of grafting that we observe as a trigger for the wound healing phases and the wound healing processes. The classical wound healing process or phases as described by Clark in 1996 are basically hemostasis. It's going to be followed by inflammation, proliferation and remodeling that has not changed. We are very fortunate in many ways to work in the oral cavity because the oral wound healing is described and it is defined by different factors 
that expedite this process and make things possible that in some other areas of the body take longer and are more challenged. I would like to also share this material by Mauricio Araujo, who in 2005 gave us a beautiful histological sample of the dynamics and the physiological events that occurred after a tooth was removed. He was able to document the events that happen a week, two weeks, four weeks, and eight weeks in the canine model on areas that had been exposed to extractions of teeth, and we were able to see what happened with the uh, morphology of these alveolar sockets. This image allows us to see the changes that occur that take place during that period of time, and we come to realize that at the eight-week time, at the eight-week timeline, we are seeing that the uh, buccal plate is being lost dramatically compared to the lingual plate. Also, we see a loss of height on these contours. Later on, Ronald Jung, in 2013, he published an article, very clever article, comparing as well areas and sockets that were manipulated and sockets that were not manipulated with biomaterials. And again, was able to demonstrate with these diagrams the changes that occurred when these biomaterials were used versus when they were not. It is interesting to note that not all patients heal the same. For instance, you're looking at an image of two different individuals followed up after a week uh, after a tooth has been removed. And you can see on the left screen of the left image where a socket is struggling to heal on the right side, you have a complete different outcome. And we always question ourselves, why is this happening? We know that there are different factors that are going to differentiate the outcome. One of them is a space provision. The second one is undisturbed wound healing maturation, which is key, the, especially emphasizing the undisturbed. Blood clot stability, and all of this is critical when we're looking at those early healing phases of healing. Those are the most important times during healing. We know from the periodontal literature that space provision is critical. We have learned the utilization of membranes in these sites. And uh, we also know that protection and stability of the blood clot is key when we are promoting regeneration. Not all factors, not all defects are the same. We have defects that are going to be defined by the presence of these walls that are surrounding either the alveolar or the tooth, in this case, the alveolar socket. Depending on the proximity, depending on the configuration, depending on the presence and number of walls, that blood clot is going to be nourished and protected in different fashion in different ways. Let's take a look at the second point of this presentation, alveolar reconstruction. What are we doing? Alveolar reconstruction, it is determined and it is defined as it is on natural teeth by the quality and the uh, quantity of bone that is surrounding these defects. We are, as periodontists, we are very familiar with how we deal with these defects and how these defects behave around natural teeth. And when we look at the other sockets on single teeth, they're very similar. We have defects that are very well defined, very well protected and they're going to fill with blood clots without any type of disturbance. Then we have some defects that are much more compromised. There are defects like this one in this photograph where the whole buccal wall is gone, and those defects are going to require a different approach when we're dealing with them. I would like to now illustrate a couple of patients. This patient that is going to have a treatment plan that is going to be timed. When we have this patient, the first time that this patient presents to see us, we are suspecting something is structurally wrong with this tooth. There is a sinus tract. We are probing about 12 millimeters with that North Carolina instrument. Once we elevate the flap, we're going to be able to diagnose a root fracture. The tooth is going to be removed. The socket is going to be debrided and prepared to have a biomaterial placed. In this situation, we are using a xenograft that is bound with collagen, 10% collagen. And this biomaterial is going to be placed in this recipient site. Not only we're going to be placing it, but we're also going to be protecting it with a collagen membrane, a native collagen membrane. And we're going to approximate tissues and let Mother Nature do its work. This is how that patient came back six months afterwards. And six months afterwards, we have nice healing, very thick tissue. We're going to re-entry this site, and we have seen that there is complete recovery of this area. 
we have a solid structure that we're going to be preparing to receive a dental implant. And this dental, this dental implant was placed and it was so stable that allowed us to proceed with the fabrication of a fixed restoration that was supported by that implant. This is how we started. This is how we were six months later. This is how we started. This is how we were six months later. Let's take a look at a second approach where time sequence is kind of avoided in many ways. We have been looking at the placement of dental implants again since Richard Lazara presented that concept. When we look at data of alveolar sockets receiving an immediate dental implant, we see that survival rate is very similar to the conventional approach. Again, Mauricio Araujo in 2006 warned us that perhaps this was not a good approach, this was not a good idea to place an implant immediately after a tooth was removed. And as you see on this diagram, on this histological slide, you can see the buccal wall just completely diminishing compared to the lingual wall after an implant had been removed. Later on, these concepts were reviewed by the same team of researchers, 2011. Things were changed, the diameter of the implant, and most important, the management of the alveolar socket at the time of the implant was also modified. In this situation, they were placing a xenograft bound with collagen on the buccal plate, and that made a big difference, delaying and modifying what was going to happen. It delayed the uh, resorption of that buccal plate. One of the uh, big questions that we had was, especially working on the aesthetic area, what is going to happen to the papilla? And we know from the periodontal literature from Tarno back into 1992, that height of that papilla is determined by the presence and the distance of the alveolar crest to the most apical portion of the uh, interproximal embrasure. And it is how we have to be very careful when we're seeing patients, especially for the first time. We have to be able to keenly advise and warn what the situation can present down the road. On the left side of the screen, you have a patient with abundant tissue. We know that that patient is a very good candidate to receive a dental implant on any type, of any type of restoration and it's going to be successful just because of the presence of that tissue. On the right side of the screen, we have CAJs exposed interproximately. If we tell a patient on that case that a dental implant is going to be the most conservative type of approach, we're probably going to be getting in trouble. The reason being is that when the time comes to restore that dental implant, we're going to end up with some black triangles that are present as a consequence of not having that inter interdental papilla. And we know that from literature as well, Choquet in combination with Dennis Tarno in 2001 made the point showing us that yes, the presence of the papilla, it is also determined by the alveolar crest and that distance that exists from that most coronal portion of the alveolar crest and the most apical portion of the interproximal embrasure in the presence of an implant and a natural tooth. Things have not changed. And this is how we can anticipate an outcome that bio, it's going to be resembling and mimicking mother nature in a very nice fashion compared to a case, as you see on the right side, where we're going to be struggling to meet those aesthetic needs for these patients. Another question that we had was, what is happening with stability of tissue at the mid-buckle aspect? In other words, what's happening with gingival recession? And the research that probably allowed me and encouraged me to approach these type of procedures uh, much more diligently was the work by Tim DeRook in 2009. He showed us that if we were able to remove a tooth, place an implant, and provisionalize that implant, we're going to be able to maintain and prevent gingival recession that is commonly associated with immediate implant placement. There are some other factors as well, not only provisionalization, but implant diameter and the location of that implant as well. This following video is going to uh, exemplify, it's going to show how we handle in our practice a fracture incisor. We're going to start, and all these cases are starting the same way. We're going to be working as carefully as possible to remove the tooth. In this situation, there was some bonding on the lateral. We're going to be removing that as well before we start with the extraction of the uh, central incisor that needs to be removed. As carefully as we can, we're going to be rotating that tooth until we remove it. That tooth, once is removed, analyze that all the parts have been uh, extracted. 
we're going to spend some time making sure that the alveolar socket is clean. Good magnification, good illumination is going to be of paramount importance to accomplish this part of this procedure. Once we're able to debride that socket, we're going to proceed with the preparation of that site to receive a dental implant. There are, of course, many publications that uh, illustrate the placement of that implant. We're going to try to do this at the expense of the palatal wall. We're going to be managing that uh, gap that exists between the lingual aspect of the buccal wall of bone and uh, the implant. We're going to use an acrylic quad, in other words, a provisional restoration that is going to help us keep those teeth in place. Now, looking at another approach, and this approach is a little bit more um, extreme, so to speak. We have an individual in this situation that had a fracture of her central incisor. This central incisor fractured and it left a buccal plate that was compromised. As you can see, I'm touching that tissue, soft tissue, where the alveolar plate used to be for this patient. We're going to remove the tooth and we're going to utilize a native collagen membrane. That native collagen membrane is going to be secured with a non-resorbable monofilament suture material in a couple of areas. And I think that stability is crucial for this type of procedures because it is going to favorably facilitate the manipulation of that socket when we're working with a xenograft that is going to be placed. We're seeing the application of the xenograft bound with collagen and a implant will be also inserted. Now we're going to be managing that gap and we're going to be placing a provisional restoration to protect that material that has been utilized. So those are two types of approaches and in 2011 we saw a German group that was showing us that this was not crazy to do, showing some validation of those immediate placements and managing these sockets. And again, we have seen some more recent publication in 2011 in the Journal of Periodontology by the group uh, ASAF showing us exactly the same thing. Some of these buccal dehiscences can be managed at the same time that an implant is placed. As practitioners, we are bombarded with different materials. We have different communications, electronic, and we receive mail communications showing us the properties of different materials. And it can be sometimes overwhelming. As clinicians, we have to make decisions of what type of material we're going to be utilizing. Is it going to be a membrane that is going to be serving our purposes for the short term or the long term? What type of graft are we going to be utilizing? Is this graft osteoconductive or is this graft osteoinductive? There are different advantages and disadvantages of using these materials. I would like to share with you one of the research projects that we were engaged with, a sponsor and under the auspices of the Maguire Institute. A group of practitioners and colleagues got together and uh, did a research work that has been recognized by the American Academy of Periodontology with a, an award. We were comparing two techniques. We were comparing two techniques and uh, two different approaches of managing alveolar sockets that were compromised. Their buccal plates were affected and uh, this is what we uh, decided to do. We had two different groups of uh, subjects. The first group compromising or comprised of 20 individuals. They all had the same type of defect. That defect had to be severe where the buccal wall was missing. The first group was going to receive a xenograft and that xenograft was going to be combined with a native collagen membrane. The second group that we were looking at we were studying a similar type of defect, but this group was receiving an allograft, and that allograft was also combined with a collagen membrane that was cross-linked. Different qualities, different properties. This is an overview of that study. And uh, we were looking at a post-extraction rich preservation as the goals. We were looking at a prospective randomized controlled trial multi-center type of research. Four individuals were enrolled, as I was alluding to, and the quality of the characteristic is that we were dealing with severe buccal wall loss on those posterior sextants. The uh, test group was the xenograft in combination with a non-cross-linked collagen membrane, and it was compared with the allograft and the cross-collagen uh, membrane. That was the control group. 
We were following up these individuals up to six months, and we did a re-entry and a biopsy. Interestingly, on the result, only 37 implants were placed at re-entry. And those 37 implants that were placed, or actually, rather, the three implants that were not placed was due to insufficient bone, and they all happened on the control group, the group that was characterized by the allograft and the cross-linked collagen membrane. We were also looking at some other factors like inflammation and how that suture line was going to behave as far as the healing process was concerned. And we also observed that in the control group, after one month, 88% of those lines remain open. We were able to conclude that uh, the test group, the xenograft combination with the uh, native collagen membrane, had a gain of 1.76 millimeters in width compared to the control group. We were, as I said, we were looking and making observations on inflammation, regeneration, soft tissue healing, how that suture line was closing on that gap, and we were also looking at uh, the uh, horizontal bone gain differences. Just to summarize this, some of the highlights of this study, some of these pictures illustrate the three individuals, three different centers, all belonging to the same modality of treatment that did not heal well and needed to be regrafted before an implant was placed. And you can see a second group at baseline and then at re-entry, not offering good quality bone for us to be able to place a bone, and another group, another patient, I should say. The results, we were able to work with the Freiburg University. And uh, of all these numbers, I think what matters to see is the very similar results. Perhaps when we take a look at the graft, we're seeing that there is much more presence of a xenograft, which is normal. Xenograft is going to have a slower resorption compared to the allograft. And as a consequence, we're going to have differences on the new bone mineral in contact with the graft as well. But otherwise, everything was very similar. Let me exemplify, share an example, actually, of one of these individuals. This is one of our patients here in Fenton, a patient that showed up with a, a root fracture, as you can see on the very first image on the left side. The tooth was removed. The area was debrided. Measurements were taken utilizing surgical stents designed specifically for this application. A xenograft was placed and covered with a native membrane. Tissues were approximated and closed. The patient was followed up after a week. You can see the images four weeks afterwards as well, at three months, three months as well from the onoclusal view. And then we did a re-entry six months afterwards. At six months, we were able to come in and take a look at those tissues. Measurements were made, utilizing those surgical guides that we had used at the beginning. And this healing allowed us to place an implant and that is the periapical radiograph of that implant being placed. The case was finally restored, and this is a 12-month view of the occlusal of the occlusal view and the buccal view of the restoration which was screw retained. This is a radiographic sequence of the same case when you take a look at the initial presentation, the grafting at six months, the time that we took the biopsy or the prepare the site for the implant placement and the implant in place. This is the trifine sample that was taken in order for us to take a look histologically and see what was happening with this bone as it was healing. This is the type of result that we obtained for each one of the biopsies that were taken for this research. And the histology was beautiful, what we received from Freiburg University. And uh, perhaps a close-up view that I would like to share with you is this image right here, which has different views of what was happening with the xenograft. And a close-up of the very last image shows what we have come to call a functional structural uh, unity or entity, where we see that in the xenograft particle, the xenograft particle is harboring vital bone. We see new bone formation. We're seeing osteoblast activity. And we see what seems to be a blood vessel as well, just leaving tissue within that xenograft particle very interesting, triggering, remodeling, and so on. Let's take a look at now, what is it that we are doing? Where are we heading? What is next? What is it that we're doing in our practices? What is it that uh, is catching our eye and uh, uh, catching our attention? When we are dealing with extraction sockets, one of the fundamental efforts that we would like to pursue is to protect these sockets. I'm going to show you three video clips 
of some of the alternatives that we have in order to protect these sockets. One of them is working with an autogenous seal. The autogenous seal, again, is going to start, and all of these cases are going to start in the same fashion. We're going to remove the tooth. Once the tooth is removed, we're going to go to the same patient, to the palate. We're going to use a tissue punch, and we're going to utilize a tissue punch to harvest some of this tissue. The recipient site is going to be prepared, and that autogenous plug is going to be secured, in this case, utilizing non-resorbable suture. That is one approach that we've been utilizing in our practices. Another approach that was described by Anthony Sklar back in the late 90s, again, it starts from the same point. We're going to be preparing that recipient site, epithelializing that recipient site. We're going to use a collagen sponge that collagen sponge is going to be sectioned and prepared. We're going to bring it to that recipient site and we're going to be securing it, again utilizing the same type of suture material. The next approach, it is similar to the other two in the sense that it begins the same way. We're going to be removing the tooth. Once the tooth is removed and those areas are debrided, we're going to be utilizing a bilayer collagen material, a collagen plug, mucograft seal. We're going to be securing it, again utilizing non-resorbable material, monofilaments, and this is how this patient is going to exit our practice once we are done with this procedure. So you just saw the three modalities that would allow us to handle these extraction sockets. The literature, when we take a look at the literature, and this is important for us to review, we're looking at different authors that have contributed in the literature. Some of them have been looking at collagen sponges. As you can see on the left side, they have a greenish kind of a tint. And some of them have started to contribute looking at the uh, materials with bilayer collagen, like the mucograph seal. And we have nowadays an article that was published this year in 2007 comparing both techniques. I would like to take a few minutes to talk about this particular article, the article by NATO. This comes from Tufts University, the group by Stefan Bjorn. And mainly what they were doing, they were looking at hard and soft tissue remodeling. It was a prospective randomized controlled trial. They had 28 individuals involved. Interestingly, they were also looking at single rooted teeth. And the way that they gather information was looking at stents. They had some stents that allowed them to uh, make their measurements, and they were also looking at data following and utilizing cone beam CT scans. They had two groups. The test group was utilizing a collagen matrix seal, or the mucograph seal, and they were comparing it to a collagen sponge. That was their control group. They were utilizing an allograft as the socket filler, and they were following these patients up to four months. What did they observe? What were those results? Number one, they were looking at a reduction of the coronal ridge. And that reduction was happening on the horizontal fashion in a very similar dimension when you take a look at the test group and the control group. They were also looking at vertical changes. And vertical changes, they were also be able to see that it was happening. There was some resorption on the vertical dimension, and it was very similar for both the test and the control group. They concluded that there was a slight increase in the buccal gingival thickness at the coronal part, minimal, 0.9 millimeters for the test and 0.5 millimeters for the control. And as a reminder, or perhaps the message to take home, was that when they were utilizing both materials, both the collagen matrix seal and the collagen sponge in combination with the allograft. These two approaches were minimizing rich resorption, and they were both maintaining soft tissue thickness in those sockets, minimizing again the buccal plate loss on less than two millimeters, right? That was very important. With that information, knowing that we have done some research and we have some data available for us to study, Something that we have been doing in our practices is looking at how things heal when we try to accomplish primary closure, which is going to ultimately protect the alveolar 
socket, the alveolar um, socket, and whatever we have placed, the biomaterial and the blood clot in, in place. We have had different alternatives as we reviewed before. Another alternative that I had not mentioned, once there is a tooth that needs to be removed and that, that area needs to be protected, we can also utilize non-resorbable materials. The downside with non-resorbable materials is that we have to go back and retrieve them, as it is the case with this particular material. They do perform well. They allow us to preserve those sites, and we can go back and place our implants if that is what we desire to do. But that is the downside. It is having to have a second procedure to remove those materials. Deformities. Sometimes we also observe changes, anatomical changes, especially if we're working with the aesthetic area, that can be very important. As you can see, the change in this slide of the mucogenual junction line and some of the scarring that can be, that can happen when we're trying to achieve primary closure with some of these extraction sites. Something that concerns me as myself as well is in some individuals, they come back to see us and the material, the biomaterial that we have placed to protect the graft material is gone and we end up staring at particles of material. Sometimes they are well contained, sometimes they escape. What is happening with these patients? Doesn't matter what type of suture technique you utilize. In some situations, these patients come back, as you can see in this case, a week later, and that biomaterial is gone. That biomaterial is absent, and we're staring at some bone grafts that are probably exposed to the oral environment. Is that good? Or is that not good? Those are the things that we're, we're actually uh, asking ourselves. When you take a look at some of these materials, as I said, it doesn't matter how you are going to be securing them. Individually, in some situations, that material is lost. The graph material is exposed. And we observe some patterns that are very uh, in agreement with delayed healing. Sometimes those exposure areas are smaller, determined perhaps by the proximity of soft tissue at the time of extraction and so on. But we also see that material being exposed, as you can see a week afterwards. We started using in this, in our practice, we started using the bilaria collagen material. And something that I like about this material is that allow us to do several things. Let's take a look at this particular patient. This patient had a vertical fracture on a lateral incisor, maxillary lateral incisor. You can see the extent of the fracture. The tooth was non-restorable. The tooth was removed. And the alveolar socket was preserved to the extent that we could do that. That area was debrided and prepared to receive a grafting material. For many reasons, we went with the xenograft, ease of manipulation. It also allows us to have a material that does not resorb as fast. It is going to also give us some dimensional stability by the slow resorption as well. In these areas on the aesthetic area, I think that is important. We are protecting that material utilizing a native collagen membrane. And this is what I like about utilizing the bilayer collagen material to seal the occlusal portion of this extraction site. As you can see, is the approximation of those flaps where they belong. We do not have to elevate a flap and we do not have to apply periosteal releasing incisions in order to manipulate and bring that tissue down as we usually do. The beauty of that is that it's also going to decrease some of the uh, side effects that we are going to give patients by doing these type of procedures. In other words, we're going to be seeing less swelling less edema, less uh, hematomas as well. It is much friendlier to the patient as well. This is a sequence of events a week afterwards, a week after that uh, collagen material was placed in sight. At two weeks, we still see it in sight, protecting that graft material, allowing that soft tissue to kind of migrate and seal that with soft tissue. This is at four weeks. This is three months afterwards. At nine months, we are having an implant placed in that area with minimal invasion of that site. And the patient has had an implant restored for already 24 months very successfully. 
Another individual had a periapical lesion. The tooth was removed. And again, tissues were simply approximated where they belong. We utilized the bilayer collagen material or matrix, the mucograph seal. And you can see in this view, probably much better the approximation of that flap where it belongs. Passive approximation. And we're going to now let Mother Nature do its work, assisted, as we said in the beginning, assisted healing with this type of material. This is a week afterwards. This is uh, two weeks where you start seeing some of the blending of that material with the native tissue. And this is six months afterwards. When you take a look at re-entry, we were able to find solid bone that allow us for the preparation of the osteotomy and the placement of an implant. We take a look at a more complex case. This is an endoperiolition that had destroyed bone at the apical level of this patient. We had two entry points, an occlusal and an apical entry point for grafting. We're making measurements for documentation. We're going to use a xenograft bound with collagen, 10% collagen. Ease of manipulation is key. We're going to be making sure that this defect is going to be well protected, that it's going to be well encased with this type of material. We're going to proceed with securing the apical axis utilizing non-resorbable material, suturing material, and then we're going to be sizing down the bilayer collagen material. We're going to be securing it again with, with non-resorbable uh, monofilament suture material. And this is the appearance after a week. And this is after three weeks. Soft tissue is taking over that graft has been protected. This is three weeks afterwards, the same image after sutures have been removed. And this is six months afterwards. Implant, has, implant placement takes place. And this is at seven months, one month after healing. And this is that final restoration for the patient and the soft tissue that she has right now. So we know that some of these materials are going to be stimulating and they're going to be facilitating the presence and the colonization of some cells. On this image you see some green cells that represent fibroblasts and some red cells that represent endothelial cells. The growth and proliferation is facilitated by the structure, the composition of some of these materials. Not all biomaterials are the same. And this is one of those examples, one of those cases. Some materials are going to be much more friendly to osteoblast proliferation. Some of these materials are going to be much more friendly to fibroblast propagation and angiogenesis. All of these are key ingredients when we're looking at regeneration and regenerative procedures. Another case that also comes handy for what we do, especially nowadays with implant complications, this individual, a very young male, very healthy, had an implant placed and that implant failed. The central incisor failed. We were able to protect that site with a xenograft and we placed a material as well that was going to help us secure the bilayer collagen material. You can see how that sequence of events is following with the healing, with the early healing. Soft tissues being proliferating in that area. And when we take a look at four months of reentry, that area was solid and it allowed us to place an implant four months afterwards. This is for the explantation of an implant. So it was a point of contention for us and trying to figure out what is the most ideal material that we could be using. And again, under the generous auspices of IMAC Institute, we're able to get a group of clinicians, not only periodontists this time, but we also have some oral surgeons involved with this research, comparing both a collagen sponge with the bilayer collagen matrix or the mucograft seal. The design of the study comprised of 25 patients and these 25 patients were going to have the same type of defect, very well-defined defect. We we're going to be using a xenograft and we were going to be using the uh, mucograft seal in one of the groups. On this other group, we we're going to be using the same type of confined, well-contained defect, utilizing a xenograft and the collagen sponge. 
this video is going to show the sequence that took place with one of those patients. At day zero, we're removing the tooth. We are placing the uh, sinograft material as well. We are securing it. We're following these patients early, three days, later uh, one week, at uh, two weeks. We're making measurements of those gaps and uh, evaluating the presence of biomaterials. This is at week four week eight, we followed up to week 16. At week 16, we are taking some measurements, soft tissue measurements utilizing the soft tissue punch. We're scoring the soft tissue punch with a round burr, allowing us to get dimensions of soft tissue. And for some of these individuals, we also proceeded to trefine both the soft tissue and the hard tissue, and we're sending it for examination prior to implant placement. At this point, this patient was exit from the study. That is the sequence of events that took place in the different centers. Just a summary, and again, we're at the point that we're looking at data, but just for you to be able to compare what was happening with these individuals, looking at the uh, top portion of the screen, you see the individuals that were treating with the collagen, the collagen sponge. And on the bottom, you see the patients that were treated with the uh, bilayer collagen matrix. And you can see what happened at day zero, not much of a difference. But you start seeing differences, for instance, in this particular patient at day three, where that sponge is not to be found is not present anymore. At one week, you can see a dramatic change, significant difference. At two weeks, at three weeks, you can see how soft tissue is healing, delayed healing on the area where that graft material was not protected. We're looking at one month, at two months afterwards, and at that time the implant is going to be placed. And some of the things that we're looking at is not only the configuration of the soft tissue, but also if this delayed healing affected the position of the implant as well. We're working in combination with Alan Herford from Loma Linda University, looking at some micro CT scans as well, and allowing us to get a better understanding of what's happening with soft tissue and hard tissue. And I think from the research by Tom Linkovicius, we know that soft tissue plays an important role on stability of bone at the alveolar crest level. We're very interested in finding this out. As I said previously, we're looking at soft tissue healing patterns. We have devised a classification system to help us understand a little bit better what's going on with the different healing topographies that we are looking at. That's what we're doing at this point, collecting data and evaluating and trying to learn much more what's happening with the different patterns of healing. Just to conclude, what matters? What is really important? Are all biomaterials the same? We know from the work from FRATS that even when we're looking at the basic components of our bodies, collagen, collagen comes in different varieties and not all collagen membranes, not all collagen based material is the same. Different qualities play a different role. Collagen communicates in different way with different cells. And as we are also learning from different research and different reviews, an excellent review by Gustavo Avila Ortiz makes this point as well. And looking at some of the work that is coming from the lab of Christer Dowling, looking at some of these biomaterials and the way that these biomaterials are actually communicating with cells and are dictating the way that healing events take place. It is extremely interesting and extremely exciting to learn about this. It is, of course, a responsibility to become knowledgeable about biomaterials. Diagnosis is also key. We can be working with the best biomaterials, but if we do not have good quality diagnostic skills, we're going to be dealing with catastrophic results like this one, in which perhaps it's not so much the biomaterial that was utilized, but also the diagnostic skills of the clinician. But when biomaterials can be utilized and they can be applied to the full potential, combining these diagnostic skills and execution of prime clinical skills, we can end up with results that are going to serve our patients in the most extraordinary way. With that said, I just wanted to thank you for your attention, and I think this is a good time to close the presentation and open the uh, forum for questions that you may have. Thank you again.
Hello. Uh, just uh, to encourage everybody right now to uh, feel free to submit your questions. I'm going to start addressing some of the questions that are already coming in. Uh, the first question that I see here, um, it says, when you started to practice, what has changed the most? And uh, definitely it has been uh, an interesting path, an interesting uh, journey. When we uh, finished our program or training, uh, even in dental school, it is amazing when you realize uh, what you know and what you don't know as far as uh, the knowledge and the skills and the experiences uh, throughout the years, uh, throughout the successes and failures. It is interesting to see how much you can learn and how much you can start visualizing and seeing as far as what you can understand and how you can treat your patients. Definitely, I think what has changed the most is perhaps uh, the way the way to um, to be able to uh, analyze and uh, address different cases. I think the information that we have, I think the uh, um, diagnostic tools that we have, uh, also some tools like the microscope that allow us to be able to see much better what we're doing. It is um, allowing us to see with much more clarity what we do. Obviously, the body of research, the body of research that we have nowadays is also very important that it has given us different horizons, different information that has allowed us to change some of the ways that we practice. Um, I became, I've been practicing already for over 20 years as a dentist and uh, things are completely different in many, many ways the way that we've been practicing, but some of the uh, realities remain. For instance, we're still working with uh, patients that offer challenges as far as healings, uh, that offer challenges as far as their systemic component and so on. So definitely that is something that we have to keep in consideration, keep in mind. I'll move on to another question. Uh, there is a question that says, you talk a lot about soft tissue today. Please tell me what you find most interesting to biomaterials or new techniques and procedures. When it comes to soft tissue, I think soft tissue is definitely a factor that perhaps when we were starting to look at dental implants, for instance, it was not so interesting. We were focused primarily on bone, also integration, making sure that uh, the uh, implant was going to integrate, it was going to fuse to bone. Eventually, we became to realize that this was okay, that this was fine, but uh, we had some aesthetic challenges and that we needed to compensate and we needed to, most important, preserve soft tissue, the architecture of tissue as well. We've been having some biomaterials that have allowed us to also work and combine them in order to make tissue more robust, in order to try to anticipate soft tissue changes, in order to anticipate perhaps the way that things are, that tissues are going to heal and modifying and keeping in mind these ways of approach and these ways of um, uh, procedures themselves, we are being able to better manipulate some of these soft tissues, enhancing sometimes as well with uh, tissues that are either um, allografts or autographs or scenographs, uh, we have different resources that allow us to manipulate that in many ways as well. Another question, you mentioned a study with severe bone defects in which you were one of the clinicians. Based on that study, what has changed in the way you practice dentistry? The uh, research that uh, the person who asked that question is alluding to is that uh, research that we focused on with the uh, 10 group of uh, clinicians, practitioners, looking at major defects where the buccal wall was almost non-existent. And I think based on that experience, has allowed us to realize that a xenograft combined with collagen and also protected with a resorbable membrane that is based on, made out of native collagen, is a very reliable material to allow us to work and keep dimensional stability when it comes to placing implants. At the end of the day, we have to remember that patients do not come to see us because we can grow bone, because we can protect bone beautifully with uh, uh, very nice sutures and materials, they come to see us because they want a solution to their edentalism um, provided. And uh, it is important, it is our responsibility for us to be able to place implants in a predictable fashion. If we're going to be using materials, we need to use materials that are going to allow us to accomplish those goals. And that was probably the biggest lesson. Since that research, I honestly, I was not 
familiar with that type of material and I've been using it almost all the time whenever I have a defect that is uh, of that challenging nature uh, because I know it is going to be reliable because I know it is going to work well for me. So definitely it has changed that way that I practice tremendously, significantly. I'm going to another question. Um, thanks, excellent lecture, thank you. What's your opinion about platelet-rich fibrin plugs and membranes to achieve socket preservation? And uh, I'll be honest with you, when it comes to fibrin plugs, uh, platelet-rich fibrin plugs, I do not utilize them. I've been exposed to the technique. I know in some practitioners' hands works very well to protect the, uh, the socket, to protect the bone graft material as well. But uh, in my hands, I do not have experience in that topic. So uh, I apologize. I'll have to defer that question to some practitioners who have more experience than I do. Looking at another question, in a relatively intact socket, how often do you wait before placing an implant and what factors do you consider? Talking about a relatively intact socket, we're looking at a socket that is well contained. The buccal, the palatal or lingual mesial and distal walls are intact. We have soft tissue that has not been traumatized. Those areas, of course, depends a lot on the patient and the systemic status of the patient, but all things considered, let's say we have a patient who's uh, healthy and stable systemically. I like to wait a little longer than two months. There was a time where I was waiting six months, no matter what, and we're talking about probably uh, 13, 15 years ago. We started seeing some research where the envelope was being pushed a little bit and we're being, we were being played, we were being placed, we were placing implants, I'm sorry, uh, just as early as eight weeks, two months after the tooth had been removed. And I was on that type of practice for a while that type of application for a while, but I was finding very inconsistent results. Sometimes I would go back and uh, this solidity, the robustness of that grafted material was not what I wanted to work with. And uh, I started scaling back and nowadays I'm waiting three months, it's almost my standard waiting period, waiting three months to place implants um, after an intact socket has been dealt with. Looking at another question, what are other promising areas of investigation that your research group is looking into? At this point, we are focusing on soft tissue. And uh, I do believe that soft tissue has a lot to explore. We still don't understand the, uh, the, the, the patterns of healing. We're still perhaps not understanding and grasping the implications of those different phenotypes, how the phenotype is going to affect bone, how that phenotype is going to affect that bone that we are protecting with different materials. I think we are excited to start looking at different materials that are coming out in the market and see the potential on enhancing tissue dimensions, on enhancing tissue stability as well. I think there is a lot to do with soft tissue and uh, that's where we're heading in this moment. Another question, um, what do I do when a lot of graft material is lost due to the membrane exposure or loss at the recall visit? That's a great question because I've had to deal with that not all the time, but unfortunately it happens. And when it happens, it is puzzling. Uh, it is one of those things that you're not prepared. Usually those patients are coming in for a quick follow-up. You're going to spend some time removing sutures, going for some reinforcing post-operative instructions and so on. So when you see those areas that are not healing that well, it's kind of a shocker. Um, mainly we look and make sure that there's no infection. We are going to uh, usually remove sutures. Those sutures are not doing anything else at this point, especially if, if I have lost the material that is protecting those sockets. And uh, I'm going to monitor those patients and see how they're going to be healing. It's been interesting. Some of these patients have come to heal um, in a, kind of an uneventful manner. And uh, unfortunately, some of these patients, when they're coming back, it is almost a guarantee that we're going to have to do some sort of regrafting at the time of implant placement, um, if we can place the implant. Uh, very rarely we cannot place the implant. I don't have numbers in front of me to quote that and give you a more objective answer. But uh, it varies, I think, a lot on, on the uh, adjacent tissues, adjacent teeth, adjacent uh, ulcers architecture that is going to determine the way those patients are going to heal. So it is definitely important for me as a clinician to have a material that seems to behave consistently well, that is predictable, that stays there and protects that blood clot, and protecting that blood clot is going to protect that graft material as well. Great question. Thank you. 
another question. And uh, it'll be the last question since it's coming to the end of the uh, time allotted for the webinar. What do you think of pedicle connective tissue graft technique result compared to all the techniques that you showed? I think that is a very uh, interesting approach. I, I do believe that it's very viable. Um, obviously, it has limitations depending on where you're going to be working on. Uh, the maxillary arch, of course, it is a, a prime candidate for this technique. It is uh, invasive, obviously. It is a little bit more invasive in that sense. Um, it has uh, perhaps more morbidity, of course, just because of the nature of the procedure. But it has shown uh, clinically that it is a very viable approach. Again, if we kind of try to avoid morbidity and try to have these experiences as uh, innocuous to our patients and at, at the same time make them predictable, something that I try to avoid, but in some situations when we have aggressive bone loss, aggressive defects, very um, acute defects where soft tissue is also being compromised, that is a prime technique that needs to be considered. With that said, I just wanted to thank you everyone for your attention. It's been an honor and a pleasure. I thank Geislich in particular, uh, everyone in their staff who has been so supportive to allow the uh, uh, distribution and uh, the sharing of this material. It is uh, uh, with a lot of, of gusto that I get to do this and a lot of appreciation. Thank you so much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your evening and hopefully the material that was shared this evening will be of use to you that tomorrow when you go back to your practices, you're going to be seeing things from a different perspective, consider different techniques, consider different materials, all towards enhancing your patient's experiences and of course making your treatments more predictable. Thank you so much and uh, good night from Fenton, Michigan. Take care. Bye-bye.